All right, this morning we're going we're gonna to talk about Holy Spirit power. There's something that you'll hear a lot among professing Christians. They'll talk about, oh, I just wish I could have more of the Holy Spirit. Was well, it possible to get more of the Holy Spirit? Is there a level, you know, that you can, you know, go to some kind of gas pump or something and you get, you know, give me 10 gallons or something? I mean, is this something that's there or is that a false teaching? Well, there are seven steps in the Bible. I don't believe that you can have more or less of the Holy Spirit. I just believe it's a, a matter of fellowship. I don't believe that there's that you do something and, and God gives you more Holy Spirit and you do something else and He gives you more. No, I think it's just kind of reception on a radio. You know, you get to a station and you hear a lot of crackling, a lot of static. You have to turn the dial a little bit more to get it to come in clearer. And I think that that's how it is fellowship with the Lord, we all have the Holy Spirit. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. You don't, you know, this person here, this Christian doesn't have much of the Holy Spirit. No, they have the ability to have total communication with God, you know, definitely. But it's just a matter of static. It's just a matter of tuning your life to the right channel. And we're going to look at that this morning. And I just want to say too that we're not going to talk about Holy Spirit power, power as in the early apostolic gifts. You're not going to get to a point as a Christian today where you can have the sign gifts. Okay, You're not going to ever get to that point where you're so spiritual that you can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Those were signs given to confirm the word to the Jews. Okay, The nation of Israel rejected and the sign gifts went away. Now the signs are going to come back during the time of Jacob's trouble. But that's the church isn't going to be here. So we're going to look at the seven steps to Holy Spirit power. Step number one is salvation. Uh, you're not going to have much Holy Spirit power if you're not saved. Uh, number two is sanctification. Number three is a soldier. Number four is you have to stand. Number five is suffering. Number six, sorrow. And number seven is sacrifice. So we're going to go through these. Turn first to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. That's where we're going to begin. The first point, of course, being salvation. And I'm going to show you why salvation. I mean, it seems kind of an obvious thing, but I want to show you why I included salvation. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, Wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. The point is, as a Christian, you're not to walk according to the course of this world. You should be different. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There has to be a change there. Now turn to Acts chapter 8. A good way to describe Ephesians chapter 2 and the thing of being quickened is kind of like a, a something that's battery powered uh, and not having any batteries in it. What well, has the ability to function, but without batteries, there's no power there. And that's the, a picture of a lost person. They are they have the ability to, to live for the Lord, but they're dead in trespasses and sins. They don't have the battery of the Holy Spirit. Okay, And when you get saved, you are quickened. You get the Holy Spirit uh, at salvation, by the way, too. I want to just say that. The Holy Spirit comes at salvation. You don't have to pray for Him to come later on. That's heresy. Is that the second work of grace? Like yeah, second it? work of grace or... Something like that. It, it, holiness, Pentecostal, just nonsense, heresy. Acts chapter 8, verse 9. We're going to read about a man here, um, a false convert, I believe. It says, uh, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. <clears throat> and by the way, 
Why would they say that this man was a great power of God? He wasn't up there pulling rabbits out of a hat and doing fancy card tricks. He was probably doing speaking in tongues and healing types of things and stuff. He was bewitching the people and they thought it was coming from God. Okay, Can the faith healers have powers as a sorcerer, occult type powers, and perform some things? Yes, absolutely. Benny Hinn's great, great granddad. Yeah, Benny great, great granddad. It might have been. But, uh, yeah, Simon Hinn, I think is his name here. Uh, but anyhow, let's continue on here. It is possible for faith healers to have demonic powers and deceive people. Okay, verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself baptized or believed also and when he was baptized he continued with philip and wondered beholding the miracles and the signs which were done now skip down to verse 18 we're going to see what happened here and when simon saw that through laying on of the apostles hands by the way peter and john came there verse 15 they or uh, 14 there peter and john come to confirm the believers it wasn't that the believers themselves had the sign gifts of the apostles it was two of the apostles came uh, and Simon sees them laying their, hand, their hands on people and receiving the Holy Ghost. This is before the gospel is fully revealed. Okay, we're still in that signs and wonders uh, time period, right after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 18. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. What matter? Receiving the Holy Ghost. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Look at that. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. You see, he was a false convert. He had head knowledge, but it didn't make it down to his heart. His heart was, was not right with God. Okay? There are a lot of people that are like that. And they want the things that the Holy Spirit comes and brings. You know, Jesus said about the Holy Spirit is a comforter. Okay? You will have peace. You will have joy. You will have long-suffering, meekness, temperance, the, the fruits of the Spirit. And a lot of unsaved people want that, but they don't want salvation. And they go to their church and they pay their money, just like Simon, thinking that I'm going to be a good person then and God's going to be okay with me and I'm going to get to go to heaven and I'm going to get all the things that the Holy Ghost would give me, but I don't want it salvation. I don't want to repent of my sins. I don't want to change my heart condition. So right there is a picture of somebody... The very first one, first point there, if you want the Holy Spirit, you got to get saved. And buying, trying to buy the Holy Spirit is not going to work. Okay, and your money will perish with you, as Peter said to Simon. Okay, now we're going to go on to point number two, sanctification. What is sanctification? Turn to John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctification is what happens after you get saved. You realize you're a sinner, and you say, okay, I need to repent. I need to get saved. I need to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And now you get saved, and now you say, okay, what's next? Sanctification is what happens after salvation. Okay, John 17, 17. Now, that's one you ought to have memorized. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Lowercase w. That's a written word. Okay? When you get saved, you are sanctified. You become holy through the reading of God's word. And people say, well, I don't know if there is absolute truth. Yes, there is right here, the Bible. And this is how you are sanctified. This is how you get on the road to getting Holy Spirit power. Okay? It can't come any other way. Look over at John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17. Here Jesus is speaking 
with his disciples, and of course they realize that you know this man that they're that is talking to them is God manifest in the flesh. And Jesus says to him, If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit, you need to start reading the Bible, okay? And the world cannot receive that spirit. You know, this movement of these new versions, well, we got to make the Bible understandable to the lost. No, you don't. They'll never understand it. They can't. And these new versions, people say, well, I'm lost and I can understand the NIV much better than the King James Bible. Yeah, because it's it's a spiritually dead book. The Holy Spirit's not within the pages of the, of the NIV. It's within the pages of the King James Bible. Okay? Uh, look over at verse 21. John 14, verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest, manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot. <laughs> okay, this isn't the guy that betrayed Jesus Christ. It's not Judas Iscariot, it's the other one. Uh, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Now that verse right there, I, I've read that thing a couple times and it never really hit me until I was doing this study. Here you have Jesus Christ physically there, God manifest in the flesh, and he's saying, I'm going to be leaving soon, but I'm going to leave the truth with you. And he's going, well, how? If you're not going to be here physically, how are you going, how are we going to know the truth? And look at verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. You know, the most, the, the greatest warnings in the Bible are about perverting the words of God, changing, adding to, deleting God's word. And yet these people that do it, they claim to love Jesus Christ. It doesn't work. If you're perverting God's word, you don't love Jesus Christ. Period. You say, well, yeah, but what? No. There's no excuse for it. Okay, but let's continue on here. Verse 24. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost... Whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Ghost is the Comforter. He is what you receive when you get saved. And he will teach you the truth. All right, look over John, the next chapter there, John chapter 15, verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You know, this world is a very dirty, filthy place. You go out in the workplace, you go out even shopping anymore, you'll hear people using all kinds of filthy language. You know, anywhere you go, you will feel very filthy in this world if you're saved. So how do you get cleaned up? Through the Word. Well, yeah, you know, but I want to have the Holy Spirit. I want to get the, the gift of the Holy Spirit without reading the Bible. And without submitting to the Word of God, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. If you're not sanctifying yourself daily through the reading of God's Word, you're not going to do anything for the Lord. Okay? Ephesians chapter 5. And here we're going to actually see the verse that talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 through 20. Okay, it says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so be thankful for what you have and you have to speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. 
not to yourself, not to your own flesh. You know, spiritual songs are very, very important. If you listen to music that is pleasing to your flesh, you're not going to be, you know, in, in much fellowship with the Lord. Now, point number three. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You are to be heavenly minded, not earthly minded. Yeah, you have to have a job, you have to take care of things, you have bills to pay, you have food to eat, you have you know, a house to clean, you all these things, these you have to take care of that stuff, certainly. But you are to think mostly about spiritual things, about your home in heaven, about eternity, you know, and that's so important. Now, if you're thinking of those things, you aren't going to get entangled with the affairs of this life. You'll be seeking to please him who's called you to be a soldier. You know, a soldier that's at war isn't really thinking much about, you know, oh, I... I'm just going to have to mow the yard this afternoon, you know, and I, man, my car's going to need to be washed, you know, but, you know, or, or, or even looking at the tank and saying, you know, we better wash the tank. No, <laughs> you know, oh, I got, oh man, my, my, uh, outfit here, my uniform is, is dirty. I, well, I have to get that in the wash later today. No, <laughs> you're thinking about the war. You're thinking about winning it. You're thinking about reaching the next objective, you know, following the orders of your commanding officer. That's what you're thinking about. And you're to think on those things as a Christian. You are to be a soldier. Okay, there's a old song about, you know, this world's not our home. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. You know, that that's what you're to think about. And it's, you know, kind of frustrating to think about sometimes, but the fact is we are behind the enemy lines right now. <laughs> We're not in no man's land we are behind enemy lines. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, In whom the God of this world, lowercase g, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Okay? The devil is the God of this world. Well, I think things are going to work out. I think we're going to have mighty revival here in America. No, we're not. <laughs> it's going down. And you got to think about that. Ephesians chapter 6 Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. You know, tomorrow is going to be Memorial Day, and that's the day when we think about soldiers that died fighting for this country. And, you know, I'm not even concerned whether or not the wars were just or, or whatever. It's about the soldiers. They followed their orders. They fought valiantly. Okay, and that's... Uh, I think we should honor the soldiers for that reason. But Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, talk about the fact that uh, Christians are soldiers and what you should be, how you should be armed, how you should be protect yourself. Okay, verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Boy, a lot of Christians don't understand that one. Who's the enemy? Oh, it's Al-Qaeda. It's, it's, it's the government. It's, it's this group and that group. No, you don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Okay? It's spiritual. Spiritual issues are the problem. It says here, But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. If you think Obama is the ruler of the world or the United States or something, you're kidding yourself. <laughs> there are people that are far more powerful than him that are running the show. Okay, and the, and if you go above them yet, there are principalities, I believe, and demonic forces, and of course above that is Satan himself. He is the God of this world. And if they step out of line and God decides not to protect them, uh, you know, <laughs> they're not going to last very long. Okay, verse 13, 
Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Hmm, there's that truth again that comes from the word of God. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Again, a lowercase w there is referring to the written word of God. Verse 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You know, I think if you're honest with yourself, uh, I think we all need to have that prayer, that we open our mouths boldly and speak as we're supposed to speak as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. I know I need help with that one. You know, <clears throat> Holy Spirit power, uh, have you arrived, Brian? No. <laughs> I'm not uh, I'm not a spiritual powerhouse. I'm not. There are some things I need to do with my life. And there's right there's one of them, that I may open my mouth boldly. That's tough. It's very tough. The flesh resists that. But um, we'll continue on here. It says, um, I just want to say, too, that it's it is your duty to fight as a Christian, okay, and you will have to get in some kind of fight for the Lord before you get out of this life, plain and simple. If you're saved, the Lord's going to test your faith. He's going to try you. He's going to put you in a situation where it's going to be fight or flight. Most Christians choose the flight, but uh, they get out of there. They try to get out of it, but the Lord will test you, okay, and, and that's another thing. I want Holy Spirit power. Why? What are you going to use it for? I mean, are you going to use it to bring glory and honor to yourself? Are you going to use it as a little merit badge? Some kind of thing? Look at me, I'm super spiritual. I, I'm going to get a TV show and I'm going to bring in millions of dollars. Is that why you're going to use your Holy Spirit power? You know? I mean, I have a pickup truck and you say, well, I'd like to borrow it. Why? You know? And you're going to have to prove to me, that you can drive it before I give you the keys and that you're going to be responsible with it. Well, the Lord's the same way. I want Holy Spirit power. Why? Are you going to be responsible with it? What are you going to use it for? There's a statement in the military. Um, you know, you all go, everybody goes through basic training and, you know, you basically are assigned to whatever position, you know, you or whatever area you're supposed to be in. But there are a few soldiers, most soldiers, you know, they'll try to do their duty. Some of them don't do their duty very well. But then you get others that do something called going above and beyond the call of duty. And you read stories about these guys that they they were given their orders and they do their orders, they carry out their orders, but then they actually go above and beyond that. And the commanding officer doesn't even have to give them a command. They see a fallen brother out there in the battlefield, and the commanding officer doesn't say, hey, you, go get him. They take it on themselves to say, I'm going to run out there at the risk of my own life and save that fallen brother of mine. You know, that's going above and beyond the call of duty. And there have been guys that have gone through that situation and save a brother, but in the, in the end, they themselves get killed. As a result, you know, there are a lot of Congressional Medal of Honor winners that have gone through that. Uh, and that's what you're called to do as a Christian. You know, there's going to be a lot of Christians that make it to heaven that did their duty as a Christian. They followed their commands and they, you know, kind of went through life doing the routine stuff. But they never really stepped out for the Lord. They never really went above and beyond the call of duty. And then you're going to have the other Christians that went far beyond you know, what is expected of a, of a Christian. I mean, the fact is, when you get saved, you can pretty much just coast your way through life, never really do much for the Lord, get in a little fight here and there, maybe say something nice or, you know, but never really make any problems, never really make a, a, a big stand for the Lord. 
yeah, you can still go to heaven like that. You're not going to lose your salvation. But why not leave a mark for the Lord Jesus Christ with your life here? But I just want to read something else here, something else that's a temptation for a lot of Christians. I want to read a little bit, just a little paragraph here from this book. This is a book about a Marine sniper, a soldier in Vietnam, Gunnery Sergeant Carlos Hathcock II. And uh, I like to read books about soldiers occasionally. Because when I start having problems in my life and I start whining and complaining and thinking I have it rough, I think about the soldiers and I think what they went through, you know, and, and the hardship that these a lot of these guys endured. And, and, and then I kind of say, well, you know, I don't think my problems are that bad after all. But, you know, I will say that I, I would warn against reading a lot of these books because, you know, they're soldiers. And a lot of them are lost. And they speak in a way that proves that they're lost. <laughs> so, you know, be careful of that. I just want to say that just kind of as a note. But you can learn a lot from these books. Um, basically, he went over to Vietnam the first time and trained an elite unit of snipers. Okay. And he became known as White Feather because he found a little goose feather and he put it in his, his uh, boonie hat and everything else. But he gained a, a very major reputation over there in Vietnam. He left Vietnam. His tour was up. He went back home and just didn't work out. And he wanted to be back in Vietnam, back in the war. He was a good soldier. He was thinking about his buddies he left behind, you know, in Vietnam and everything else. So he went back. And he came upon the unit, this top-notch, you know, special forces unit, the sniper unit. And the guy that had taken over after him was just lazy and good for nothing, basically. And it says here he he goes in and to retake over the, his old unit. And it says here, there's no choice to be made, Gunny. My snipers come come ahead of my own pleasure. I've got a hunch that... That fella I just relieved might have tried to get along and keep everybody happy. He was a good Marine when I first knew him, but you can only compromise so far. I think he chose to keep pe folks on the hill happy, and his Marines went to hell in a handbasket. You know, there's a lot of Christian pastors out there that that's the exact situation. You have people that are members of Christian churches that are going to hell. Literal hell. You know, not just an expression like that. Why? They want to keep them happy. You can only compromise so far. I just found that amazing when I actually read that, you know, how close it is to scriptural principles. So, anyhow, let's continue on here. You do have three enemies as a Christian. Okay, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I'm just going to read some scriptures here. We aren't going to bother turning to them for sake of time. Uh, <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Luke 16, verses 14 through 15 says, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. <clears throat> and of course, James 4.4, 4, I read it a lot, says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So in other words, whatever is popular in the world, you should avoid as a Christian. You shouldn't seek to be popular with the world. As a soldier, you won't be popular with the world. The world is the enemy. Okay? Uh, your enemy number two. We're actually going to go there. Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. It says... This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Okay? Now notice that. Can you bring the flesh and the Spirit together and get them to work together? No. You can't. 
That's what's wrong with this modern rock, Christian rock, contemporary Christian music movement. Because it's fleshly music and they're trying to make it spiritual. You cannot combine the two. It's impossible. And you know, I was, again, as I was doing this sermon, the Lord kind of revealed something to me. And I went back in my mind to when I was a boy and Christian rock was really starting to get underway. And the big philosophy back then was, why are you doing this Christian rock? Why are you, you know, putting supposed Christian lyrics to rock music? And the the motivation for doing that, they would say, was so that they could win the lost. How can we reach these young people for the Lord unless we give them the rock music? And you'd say back then, back in the early 1980s, you would say, yeah, but are you going to bring this into the church now? Oh, no, 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 no. It's just to evangelize these these lost kids. We're going to, oh, we'd never even think about bringing it into the church. And I remember as a boy thinking, because I got, I got drawn into the Christian rock movement. And I remember as a boy thinking, wouldn't that be something to have rock music in a church? Wow, wouldn't that be weird? You know? And thanks be to God that I got out of that, that he convicted me of it before, you know, nowadays. But now it's actually to the point where there are a lot of churches that don't even sing the old hymns anymore. They went from having a traditional service, a traditional week, and a contemporary service, you know. They went from that to now it's just all contemporary. And you go past churches now, and you can hear the bass pounding and beating. and <clears throat> See, it's what started out as, oh, we're just trying to witness to the lost. Now it's been brought into the church which proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's about flesh. It's not about the spirit. It's fleshly, carnal, worldly music. That's all it is. Where did rock music come from? It came from the occult, Satanism. That's a fact. Study it. But I'm not going to go off on that. But uh, anyhow, let's continue on here. A good practice, by the way, to do is to read frequently... <laughs> Uh, Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 down through 26 and just kind of go down through there and compare the lusts of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit and see how you're doing. See if you're guilty of any of those lusts of the flesh. Judge yourself, by the way. Don't, you know, go down through and see how other Christians are comparing. <laughs> you, you do yourself. And you look at verses 22 and 23 and look at the fruits of the spirit and say, how many of those things are in my life right now? Galatians uh, 6, 4, let every man prove his own work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, but look at verse 24. It says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Hmm. Crucified the flesh. That doesn't sound too good, does it? Go over to Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. It says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Okay, I, there's a lot that you can say about this, but it says there that if you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. And you know, you can actually scientifically prove that. <laughs> Rock music is bad for your health even at a low level. In Soviet Russia, they would use rock music to torture the prisoners. Try sleeping some time to rock music. You can't do it. You can't do it. It's not soothing. It's not good for you. It's bad for your health. And how do you play rock music? Do you play it soft? Absolutely not. You play it loud, as loud as you can get it. Like I just said, go past any of these big modern churches. You can stand in the parking lot, the one we were in the parking lot putting tracks on vehicles, a hundred yards away from the church building, well, from the building, and <laughs> it was so loud, you could feel it in your chest. They didn't have doors open, it was through coming through a closed wall, and you could feel it in your chest a hundred yards away from the building. Do you think that that's good for your health? You're sowing to the flesh, and your flesh is going to reap corruption. As a result, you're going to lose your hearing. It's not good for your internal organs to, to be pounded like that. It's not good for you. Literally, it's not good for you. I mean, it's 
Just incredible. Um, but now verse 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for a new season we shall reap if we faint not. I just want to make a comment real quick on that before we move on to one of the things that you have to consider. There's another verse in Scripture, I don't have it written down here, that talks about no man lives to himself. You know, when you're part of the body of Christ, your actions affect other Christians. When you are a soldier, your actions affect other men in your unit. And if you are being a rotten soldier, your actions are going to affect the, the morale of other soldiers. There's a guy on YouTube, and I'm not going to name him, but one of my friends on YouTube, and he got all upset because he's not getting enough views on YouTube, and I'm just going to quit. I'm going to delete my channel, and I'm done. I'm finished. Well, you know, I'm not going to cont- or I'm not going to quit as a result of that. But I'll tell you, it's bad for morale. Seeing a- another Bible believer that I thought was stronger than that, and, and I'm going to quit. Oh, I'm not getting enough views. What is that? See, that's bad for morale. Okay, and I'm you know I'm I've been through a lot. I'm fairly strong as a Christian, but there's a lot of new believers that were looking up to that guy. And what did he do to them? Through his cowardice. Through, I'm, I'm going to quit. Don't do that. You need to think about affecting other people's morale. You need to not be weary in well-doing. Okay? Uh, let's continue on here. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 18 through 19. Talking about, as a soldier, you're going to have to fight the world. That was the first one. And number two, you're going to have to fight the flesh. It says here in verse 18, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Here you have Paul writing. Now he's having trouble with his flesh. And you think you're not going to? You know, I just read a thing that some of these holiness people, they say that, you know, your old man is dead, therefore you don't sin anymore and all this stuff. And I know the Nazarenes, some of the old time Nazarenes taught that. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Not going to happen. You're going to have struggles with your flesh until you go to be with the Lord. Look at verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. It is a continual daily battle. You do not get any (laughs) R&R from your war with the flesh. I'll grant you there are times that you can get away from the world. Okay, you can go out into the woods or you can go someplace or even in your own home. Shut the TV off. I'm not going to look about newspapers. I'm just going to sit here and enjoy. I'm going to play some nice soothing hymns and I'm going to read my Bible. You can get away from the world. You can't get away from the flesh. <coughs> um, Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Jump down there quick. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, I, I'm, in, I'm a member of the praise and worship team at church, and I dress in a way that, that the people think I'm neat and I sing neat and everything. You can't please God with that. It isn't going to happen. Okay? Verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Well, I just wish I could have the Holy Spirit, you know, and I wish I could have... Well, if you don't have Him, you're not saved. (laughs) If you have the Holy Spirit, or if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. It's just a matter of fellowship. Okay? You got to watch out for some of this stuff. But let's continue on here. Um, James chapter 4. 
turn there quick. James chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Your third enemy is the devil. Your first enemy is the world. Your second is the, the flesh. The third is the devil. Uh, verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself, yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. You don't see many modern Christians you know, applying those principles. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. That's speaking of a Christian who's right with God. You're not to be ignorant of how the devil does things. Okay? Most Christians are, though. See? Um, it's kind of interesting, too. We This morning we sang Onward Christian Soldiers. I wonder why the modern churches don't sing that anymore. Hmm. The army. Yeah, they're not part of the army. That's right. Okay, and uh, I just want to say too, if you are saved, you are card called to be a soldier and you're either going to fight the world, the flesh, and the devil or you're going to fight other Christians. And we get some of that. We get these Christians that all they want to do is just prove us wrong. They don't fight the world. They don't fight the flesh. They don't fight the devil. They're just out there to debunk others and, and they're not doing anything for the Lord. So... Okay, number four, and there's, uh, number four, let me just say this, uh, the fourth thing that you need to do to have Holy Spirit power is you need to stand, and there are 12 commands for Christians to stand, now I mean Christians, in the Pauline epistles there are 12 commands for it, now, I'm just going to read down through these verses, we're not going to go to them for sake of time, uh, Starts out in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace through with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Well, that sounds kind of militant. <laughs> yeah, it does. Galatians 5.1 Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. How do you stand fast? You can run fast. Well, that's not what the word fast means here. Fast here, stand fast, means like, fastened you know it'd be kind of like taking a pair of boots and screwing them down to a wooden deck and then saying to the soldier get in those boots and you don't move you're going to guard that door and you're not going to move you're going to stand fast right there now how do you apply that to the modern christian church do they stand fast no they actually say it's a sin not to change it's actually a sin according to a modern christian to stand fast Oh, you're stubborn. You're stuck in your ways. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm not going to move. I'm a King James Bible believer. Well, if I think that you need to move a little bit on that. No. No. I'm not going to move. I'm going to stand fast. Okay? It's just ridiculous. And I mean, something I've said numerous times, if you're a modern Christian listening to this, what kind of history do you have? Can you trace back what you do in your church? Can you trace it back 100 years ago? 200 years ago, 500 years ago. If there was such a thing as a time machine, I kind of wish there was sometimes, I could go back 500 years ago and I'd get along with the Christians back then. We sing some of the same songs that they sang back then. Okay? We stand for the same Bible that they stood for back then. You know? Even if you went back to the Dark Ages, into a Catholic church, you know, the, the most pagan, wicked church out there, 
they wouldn't even think of having rock and roll music as part of their service. Where did this thing come from? It doesn't even go back 50, 60 years. You know, the 1960s is when the thing appeared, which I guess would be about 50 years ago, essentially. Yeah. You know, where's the history of it? The Bible talks about a great falling away in the end times. If you have a rock and roll church, you're part of it. But anyhow, let's continue on here. Ephesians 6, 11 through 14. I'm not going to read all those. We already read them. But there are three commands to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. You know, stand, stand, stand. Three commands to stand in Ephesians chapter 6. Philippians 1, 27 through 28 says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Which is impossible, of course, if you're part of a church building where saved and lost come together. Verse 28, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Why are you afraid of the enemy? If you're a Christian, do you fear evolutionists? Do you fear Catholics? Do you fear Muslims? You know, anything like that? I don't. Why? Because I have the truth. I'm sanctified through the reading of God's word. I don't have to worry about all these people, these pagans out there and everything. They don't scare me. Um, anyhow, Philippians 4.1 says, Therefore, my dearly beloved breath, my dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. First Thessalonians 3, 7 and 8 says, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. Second Thessalonians 2, 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the tradi traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Stand fast. Again, um, verse or First Peter verses five, I'm sorry, First Peter chapter five verses eight through twelve says, "Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus." After that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God, wherein ye stand. Okay? Now, in the old days of battle, they would stand in a line. They'd stand in formation. But there's another kind of stand that you can take, which is about the best battle condition you can get, and that is to take the high ground and then to hold it, to stand. And that's what we're to do as Christians. We are to take the moral high ground. Okay, we should have higher standards than other people, and we should stand there and don't back down. And, you know, there's an interesting story I read from a soldier who was in Vietnam, a Green Beret commander, uh, Colonel James Bo Greitz. He was a he was the guy that they made the Rambo movies after. And he was given the mission of taking a unit of Green Berets as well as South Vietnamese Special Forces into an area and taking the high ground in this valley. And the purpose was to draw out the enemy, to draw out the North Vietnamese troops. Okay? And they did that, and they were told, you stay there and you fight for that high ground until we have the enemy drawn out then we'll send an air, a bunch of helicopters in, and we'll get you guys out of there, and then we'll come in with our bombers and strafe the valley. And for a lot of reasons, they couldn't get the helicopters in, and he lost almost all of his men. And he himself actually took a bullet to the head, and the angle of it actually deflected off the back of his skull, and all he got was a cut, <laughs> you know? And very few of his men got out. Most of the South Vietnamese Special Forces guys were wiped out. And, you know, I read that and I thought, you know, that's kind of a picture of what the rapture is going to be. We are to take the moral high ground right now and we're drawing the enemy out. And we're taking a lot of enemy fire if you are 
serving the Lord. And at some point, the Lord's going to airlift us out of here. <laughs> Come up hither, he's going to say. And we're going to go up. But I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of the Christians aren't going to make it. They're dropping like flies right now. They're saying, I don't believe Jesus is coming before the tribulation. And you're seeing that a lot. So, just wanted to say that real quick here. But let's go on to the next point. Um, number five, suffering. Uh, Philippians chapter three. Go to Philippians chapter three quick. Philippians three, verse 10 through 14. You know, these modern Christians there, again, they talk about, oh, I just want to be like Christ. You're not Christ-like. and Christ, Christ, Christ all the time. Let's look about that. Verse 10, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may, if that I may apprehend that for which I also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Okay, let's continue on here. Um, John chapter fifteen. John fifteen, verse eighteen. And we're going to see about this thing of what did Jesus Christ go through? You want to be made? You want the power of His resurrection? Well, then you're going to have to suffer like He did, and you're going to have to be made conformable to His death. John 15, verse 18 through 21 says, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If Jesus Christ was hated by the world, what makes you think that you're going to get out of it somehow and somehow be popular? It's not going to happen. There are no Christian celebrities. Think about that one. Okay, Romans chapter 8. There's a bunch of scriptures we're going through today. I know it's kind of wearying to the flesh sometimes to go through a lot of scriptures. Uh, a lot of people kind of go to sleep sometimes. and I think one of the most mentally tiring things that you can do is to listen to about three books or th yeah, three books of the Bible uh, from like Alexander Scorby or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, just sit there for a couple of hours and listen to the Bible being read. It will make you tired. Why? Well, because it's your flesh. The spirit responds and says, hey, this is great. You know, listen to that. Oh, look at that. You know, but the flesh is there going, oh, man, oh, oh. <laughs> this is boring. You know, OK, but let's read here. Romans chapter eight, verse 16 through 18 says the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Whatever you have to suffer down here on this earth isn't going to mean a whole lot to you in eternity. You know, you're going to be glad you did it. You know, when you were little and you got punished, you got spanked for being bad, you know, your parents often would say, you'll thank me when you're older. And you're going, yeah, right. <laughs> Why would I be thankful for this? But you know something? You get older and you're thankful for it. I know I am. I look back and I think, man, if my parents would have let me get away with everything, what kind of a miserable slob would I be today? It's something to think about. What suffering you have to go through down here for Jesus Christ? You get people calling you names and stuff like that. It's worth it. Okay, And if you want Holy Spirit power, you're going to have to suffer. That's something else. Well, I want to have Holy Spirit power, but I don't want to suffer. Not going to happen. Just not going to happen. All right, now let's go on to the next point. Point number six is sorrow. While we're here in Romans, just go over another chapter to Romans 9, verses 1 and 2. It says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, 
that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Now, we're not going to read the verses, but you go down through there. Why did Paul have sorrow? Because of his brethren, his kinsmen, according to the flesh. Okay, not spiritual Jews, by the way. They were actual Jews. You know, Israel is why he had sorrow. There again, do you have sorrow for the lost? Do you feel bad for them? Or are you just trying to prove a point? You know, are you trying to score another one for the team? You know, why do you why do you witness to people? Why do you have, you know, do you actually have a burden for the lost? That's a mark of the Holy Spirit being in you. Paul had the Holy Spirit, certainly. And he had sorrow, continual sorrow in his heart. And you'll have that. You know, following Jesus Christ, yes, there's joy. That's a fruit of the Spirit. But it's because of your relationship with the Lord. But when you look at the world, your joy doesn't come from the world. You should have sorrow over the world. Ezekiel 33, verse 11 says, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? God doesn't have pleasure in the death of the wicked. God's not up there laughing about it and thinking this is funny and things. I'm sure it breaks his heart. Second Peter three nine The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want the lost to perish. And I know that there's some very rotten people out there that it's very easy to hate, but we shouldn't be that way. That's a mark of the flesh. Somebody attacks you and blasts you and makes fun of the Bible, your flesh says, Oh yeah, well I'm gonna I'm gonna hit back. But you shouldn't do that. You should realize these people are deceived, and out of love you should respond to them. Now, you know, there comes a point in time when somebody should be rebuked strongly. But your first reaction should be one of love. And by the way, I just want to give a little thing here. I heard something from uh, Brother Greg Miller, which was very good. He said that uh, modern Christians are all about positive this and positive that, and they try to avoid negative neg negativism, you know, negativity, <laughs> all this stuff. And he said, what kind of good would a battery do if it was all positive? A battery needs to have positive and negative if it wants to have any power. And so it is with a Christian. You need to have, you need to be positive, but you also need to be negative if you want any kind of Holy Spirit power. But finally, let's finish up here. Number seven, you have sacrifice. Romans 12, 1, we read earlier, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now that's something else. Yeah. And by the way, it's your reasonable service there. This isn't going above and beyond the call of duty. Okay? That comes later. This is something that's reasonable. Now you need to think about that. Now what are some of the sacrifices that Christians can make? Well, number one is your free time. Second Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That sounds easy, doesn't it? No. You want to be used of the Lord, you want Holy Spirit power, you have to study. And rightly dividing the word of truth, dispensational, you know, teaching of scripture, it takes time. It takes study. And people will explain it to me in five minutes or less. I can't. I can't. True understanding of scripture takes years. And you have to read it and read it and read it. You know, I just recently finished a video and that thing took me five months. And it, well, I wasn't working on it every day. I, I couldn't. There were just days I had to walk away from it. But, you know, there were days when it was beautiful outside and sunny. And every part of me, I just wanted to get out and just go for a walk or just, oh, just get away from this work. Just get away from this study and the research. But I couldn't. I had to get the work done. And I'm not saying I'm a spiritual giant or anything, but, you know, 
if you want to do something for the Lord, it's going to take time. You're going to have to put in time. There's going to be time when you when you don't want to study the Bible. And you, you just want to just believe what you've been taught and not go any deeper than that. You know, and, and let me just say this. I don't think God has as much grace for somebody that just repeats things. God isn't looking for parrot Christians. God's looking for Christians that want to deal with him on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I want the Holy Spirit. Okay, are you willing to deal with the Holy Spirit? The Bible talks about quench not the Holy Spirit. You know, or do you quench the Holy Spirit? You know, there are a lot of people that just repeat things that they hear and they really don't have any scripture to back it up. And you start to question, well, what does the Bible actually say? Well, I don't want to think about that. See, it doesn't work. You have to be willing to give up your free time. Number two, your career. The Bible says in Luke 16, 13, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You say, okay, then a Christian shouldn't have a job. No, that's not what I said. Colossians 3, 22 through 24 says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of your of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Okay? So you are to be a good worker. That's fine. But is it at the expense of your walk with the Lord? You say, well, I got to work a lot of hours, you know, and everything else. Well, okay. You know, I know that people have bills and all that. But do you really need that brand new vehicle every two or three years? Do you really need that huge big house and, and all the luxury and everything? Why do you have a big house? Is it because you need one or is it because you want to please men? You want them to think that you're a big shot. See, weigh it out. I mean, anybody that gets into the corporate world realizes that, get, that to get to the top, you have to cut some corners. You know, hey, be a good worker. Work hard for the Lord. Provide for your family. That's what you're supposed to do. If, you're, if you are saved, if you're married, and you have a wife and kids, you know, a man that doesn't provide for his own is worse, worse than an infidel. First Timothy chapter 5. You're to provide for your own. But if that takes over and actually supersedes your walk with the Lord, where you don't have time for the Lord, eh, something's wrong. You say, well, you know, what if I don't, you know, what if I'm putting more time into my work and stuff? What if, what if I want things and stuff like that? Well, you're not going to have much Holy Spirit power. See, this message is about how do you get more Holy Spirit power? Well, you're going to have to sacrifice your free time. You're going to have to sacrifice your career. Have a job, work hard, but that shouldn't be your biggest priority. Number three, the third thing that you're going to have to sacrifice is your rep reputation. Okay, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And by the way, these four things here that I'm covering, we're going to get to the fourth in a minute, but these four things that I'm covering are the main reasons why most Christians don't have much Holy Spirit power. Because they are not willing to pay the price to receive it. First Corinthians chapter one verses twenty six through twenty nine says, "For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea." and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Are you ready to be despised? Are you ready to be mocked and called foolish and called unlearned and ignorant and everything else? If you serve the Lord, if you, are, if you want Holy Spirit power, you're going to be called all those things. And a lot of people, the praise of men is more important to them than the praise of God. And I can guarantee you, 
percent of these churches, of the churches, quote unquote churches in America, if you got up and you stood up there and you told the truth from the pulpit, the people would be enraged at you. You know, they would rush on you with one accord, you know, <laughs> like they did with Stefan, and cast you out of that place and say, don't you ever come back. That's what would happen in the majority of the churches here in America. And you know it, you know. And that's why the majority of those professing Christians, they're not willing to pay the price for Holy Spirit power. And that's one of them right there. You will be mocked. You will be despised by the world. And now for the big one. What are you going to have to sacrifice for the Lord? Number one, your free time. Number two, your career. Number three, your reputation. And number four, turn to Luke chapter 14. <clears throat> Luke chapter 14, verses 26 through 27. Here Jesus speaking. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be but my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Are you ready to lose your friends and family? Are you ready for them to not want to be around you anymore? I can tell you, if you want Holy Spirit power, that is necessary. I don't know of anybody who has any kind of Holy Spirit power at all, anybody that's really getting something done for the Lord. I don't know of one that gets along with every member of their family. I don't know of one. Are you willing to go through that? Are you willing to have old acquaintances mock you and laugh at you and, and, and say, what, whatever happened to Brian? He used to be coy. I mean, I used to like being around him. He's weird now. Are you ready for that? I have some of that. I have friends that won't talk to me. That that I actually had one of my old friends. I told him what I'm doing now. I said I'm, you know, I'm studying the Bible and the history of the Bible, and he laughed about it. He thought I was kidding. You know, why he he couldn't imagine that the guy that he used to know would actually be spending time studying the Bible. You know, it's a big funny joke to him. And you know, but he goes to church. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. And he's he's lost. He's not saved. You know. Well, I, I should really have put my friendship with him first. No. No. Hey, sorry, see ya. You don't want to be around me? Well, you know, okay, whatever. Say, what about your brothers and sisters? Most of them I don't get along with all that well. Oh, that's wrong, Brian. You should you should have a good relationship with your family. Wrong. Says it right there. I don't hate them. I love them. I wish that they would turn from their their ways. I wish they would turn to the truth. But you see, their way is that I should back down. That's what they'll try to do. You shouldn't stand so firm in this thing. See? But I want to have Holy Spirit power. I want to be be able to communicate with the Lord and have the Lord be in my life. The very last thing I want on this earth is to just do things my way. You know, there's a, a great statement that Peter Ruckman made the one time, one of the ones that you burn into your mind. And he said, the very worst thing that God can do to you is to let you have your way. And man, that is just so profound. I don't want to have my way. I want God to, to lead and direct my life. And I know from reading the Bible, from, from studying the Bible, that the way that that happens is through those seven steps. Number one, salvation. I got saved. You know, I'm not going to say we all need to be saved. No, you need to be saved if you're lost. I know I'm saved. Okay, I have it in writing. <laughs> King James Bible. Number two is sanctification. Now, I made that decision a long time ago. I said, God, I want the truth. I want you to give me wisdom. I'll pay whatever price I have to pay for it. I'll lose family. I'll lose my reputation. I'll lose any kind of career. I was a, a artist selling in some of the biggest galleries, you know, in the country. I could get my work in almost any place I wanted. I was on my way to success. I went to the wood turning center, the world wood turning center in Philadelphia, and the guy told me that my work is excellent. 
You know, I was on my way up. But it was in the wrong direction. It was away from the Lord. I thank God I didn't get into the art community. That thing is so filled with sodomites and, and new agers. It's just no thank you. I went another direction. You know, okay. It's, oh, Brian, you're, you're such a good man. No, I'm not. No, I just came to that point where I realized I want the truth. I want the Holy Spirit. And I don't care what it costs me. And you got to get to that point if you want um, to do something for the Lord. Number three, you have to become a soldier. Join the army and join in the fight. Onward, Christian soldiers. Not stay here and, and just, you know, don't do anything. Onward. Move forward. Get in some fights for the Lord. Get in a couple firefights, some sword fights, excuse me. <laughs> um, number four, you have to take a stand. Stand fast. Don't back down. Stand for this King James Bible. Don't, don't you know, well, I'm a King James Bible believer, and then somebody over here attacks you, and you go, well, not really. No. Stand fast. You can study the thing. Go to kingjamesvideoministries.com. You can learn a lot about it there. Write to us. Ask us for information on the Bible version issue. The King James Bible is the true word of God for the English people. Okay, that's why I take my stand on it. Number five, suffering. Now, that's one I have a hard time with. Do I do much suffering for the Lord? Not really. I'm trying to. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get a little bit better with that. I'm trying to... There are things in my life that I know I need to give up, and I'm holding on to it. That's tough. You know, I'm working on that one. But that's something that you're going to have to work on. Number six, sorrow. Have I experienced some sorrow? Yeah. Have you? Well, if you're doing things for the Lord, yeah. I'm sure you have, you know. And number seven, sacrifice. What have you given up for the Lord? What will you give up for the Lord? Are you willing to be despised and rejected and hated, just like Jesus Christ was? Something to think about. <clears throat> so that's how you get Holy Spirit power. And uh, I recommend that, that uh, if you're having some trouble with any of these issues, that you pray about it and you... Listen to the message again. Look up the scriptures. I kind of went through it as fast as I could there. There's a lot of verses. It's so frustrating. I know when you when you put together a message, there are so many verses, and you just want to use them all, and it's like, uh, I can't. This sermon be three hours long. <laughs> so you got to, you know, but study the Word of God. It's it's just such an amazing book. It will change you. Okay, that's so that's how you get Holy Spirit power. Uh, if you have any questions or, or anything at all, just feel free to contact us at uh, kjvbbf.com. You can go there. And, of course, kingjamesvideoministries.com, too. All right. I almost forgot this part. I wanted to read this quick. Um, as far as soldiers are concerned, tomorrow being Memorial Day, uh, you're to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. just want to read this very quickly here to... As, just kind of encouragement, something to keep in mind as a Christian soldier. It says here, It is not the critic who counts, not the one who points out how the strong man stumbled or how the doer of deeds might have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with sweat and dust and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who, if he wins, knows the triumph of high achievement, and who, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, <clears throat> so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Page 306 of Marine Sniper. And there's a lot of truth in that. You can apply that to a Christian's life. Uh, get out there and do some fighting this year for the Lord. Okay? So that's it. Thank you for listening.